Hi, everyone. This is Professor Hall, and we are going to talk today about four prominent themes in I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings. So last time, I talked about six things to know, um, six pieces of background and historical information that you need to know before reading. And now that you're into the book, I want to talk about some themes. So this lecture and the one following it are going to dig into some of the concepts that are explored in this book. Three mothers. So Maya has been abandoned by her mother when the story begins. She calls her grandmother Annie Mama. And later, when she's physically with her biological mother, she misses Mama greatly. Mothers are typically characterized as loving, caring, nurturing, and selfless. Um, Maya's mother, Vivian, is quite the opposite. She's a fun, independent, beautiful woman, and she's incredibly selfish, at least at the beginning of the novel. The actions that um, Vivian takes really cause Maya horrible problems with self-esteem. She feels ugly in comparison to her mother. She feels unworthy of anyone's affection. And um, this causes problems for her later on. Um, here's an example. Grandmother opened her arms and embraced the woman. When mama's arms fell, the woman asked, where is my baby? She looked around and saw me. I wanted to sink into the ground. I wasn't pretty or even cute. That woman who looked like a movie star deserved a better looking daughter than me. I knew it and was sure she would know it as soon as she saw me. So you can see here, um, this is the scene where she's reuniting with her mother um, and calling her grandmother mama um, and calling her mother the woman. So the woman is asking, the woman looked like a movie star, um, and she here feels completely unworthy. When Maya and Bailey are living with their mother, um, Vivian, Vivian really fails to protect Maya from her predatory boyfriend. She leaves them for alone for long periods of time. Um, however, she does not seem to question Maya's story once the truth comes out about what's happening to her. So that is really to her credit. And Mama is not a perfect mother figure either. She's a religious zealot in some ways. Um, it's, 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 we're going to get into the religion aspect in a little bit. In some ways, she's portrayed as a very loving Christian. In other ways, she's portrayed as a zealot. At one point, I mentioned before, she beats Maya and Bailey for using a phrase she considers blasphemous, which is, by the way, um, which mama says refers to the way of Jesus Christ. Um, Maya and Bailey try to explain to her how people use that phrase and she doesn't want that kind of um, talk in her house. There is a picture of Maya with her mother um, when they are both a little bit older. So later as a teenager, Maya and Bailey are reunited with their mother a second time. So now that they're older, her relationship with Vivian begins to heal bit by bit. But I, I really like how this is depicted. And here is where, you know, we talked last time about the truth versus just the facts of the situation. The truth is that when people go through this type of an ordeal, it takes time. And so instead of this great big transformation, we really see slowly the characterization of both of these women start to change over time um, and by increments. So Vivian really does, being a free, independent woman, she exhibits the traits of a strong woman and she becomes an inspiration to Maya. She encourages her to find a job and, and to... Um, fight against the segregation that's been going on in the job that she wants to get. She encourages her to finish school. She does not judge Maya once um, Maya becomes a mother herself. There are other incidents leading to their full reconciliation described in books later on. So at one point, 
Um, Maya is involved with an abusive boyfriend who is a boxer and beats her basically in almost into a coma. Her mother goes to find her, seeks her out, helps her to recover. And Maya Angelou really said that her mother, she wrote an essay at one point about her mother when her mother passed. And she said that her mother really was a horrible mother to children but a wonderful mother to, um, to, to young adults. And possibly this is because of Vivian's age at the time that she had her children. Possibly it was just because of her own tumultuous relationship with her husband. Um, but the, the depiction of this mother-daughter relationship is quite complex, as it will also be in some of the other books we're reading this semester. So these are similar things to how mothers and daughters are depicted in the Joy Luck Club, for example. And there is our author with her grandmother. So things to look for. The ways in which mama is and is not a good mother figure or substitute mother figure. How is she doing a good job in that role and where does she kind of fall short? There's a lot there in terms of how the children are loved and how love is expressed or not expressed. And that's something that I'd like you to watch for. The changing dynamic characterizations. These are both characters. Dynamic is the same as changing as opposed to static, which means that they stay the same. Does Vivian, Vivian change? Does Maya change? Do they both change? Um, that's something that I would like you to watch for. The trauma of abandonment. So missing a mother in her life um, and in Bailey's life as well. We're going to talk more about trauma next time, but there are issues that come up here with sex, with um, self-esteem, with trust, and these are things that really are directly tied to the fact that they did not have a mother and father, which we will talk about in a minute. And the differing ways that Maya and Bailey react to missing their mother, how they react with her once they are reunited. Um, Maya says in many instances that Bailey has, falls in love with their mother instantly. Um, she feels much more reserved about it and she kind of doesn't know how to even interact with this person because she's a stranger. And there's another picture of Vivian. So here's an excerpt. She asked me into her room. She sat on her bed and didn't invite me to join her. Maya, I am your mother. Despite the fact that I left you for years, I am your mother. You know that, don't you? I said, yes, ma'am. I had been answering her briefly with a few words since my arrival in California. You don't have to say ma'am to me. You're not in Arkansas. No, ma'am. I mean, no. You don't want to call me mother, do you? I remained silent. You have to call me something. We can't go through life without you addressing me. What would you like to call me? I had been thinking of that since I first saw her. I said, lady. What? Lady. Why? Because you are beautiful and you don't look like a mother. Well, that's it. I am lady and still your mother. So you can see this very awkward interaction um, between a woman and her daughter um, that the mother feels as if this relationship should almost be instantaneous. Um, you're older now. It doesn't matter that I left you for years. I'm your mother. Um, and Maya feels almost like this is a, a word that should be earned. And she doesn't look like a mother. She doesn't act like a mother. She thinks really of her grandmother like a mother. Um, and her grandmother has um, very strict morals, um, very traditional, not like this woman who is gambling and has flashy friends and um, who is very spirited and independent. So the stereotypes of, of what a mother is, the... Um, the dynamic between a mother and daughter and um, and really redefining what how does this book define what a mother is and who a, who a mother should be 
And then she calls her ma'am again. <laughs> I forgot that line. Sorry. Yes, ma'am. Um, so at any rate, those are those are the things I would like you to consider as you read. So fathers and father figures, not to place all of the blame on the mother. Um, this is a picture um, that has been associated with Maya Angelou's uncle, Uncle Willie. Um, I don't know for sure if that's the case um, at any rate. So on the outside, Maya's abandonment by her father does not seem to affect her as much as the loss of her mother, which is interesting because she really has almost a substitute mother figure in her grandmother, um, whereas various men are there kind of as um, male authority figures or father figures. Um, really, though she may not talk about it as much, she's really continually searching for a strong male figure or presence in her life. So starting with Uncle Willie, she admires him despite his disability. Um, he is discriminated for because of that as well as his race. But um, in many ways, he is somewhat that presence for her. I think not as strong personality-wise as her grandmother. So the, her grandmother's a lot more... Um, commanding in the household. After leaving her grandmother's care, the sexual assault she endures really is almost a direct result of this abandonment because she does not understand how fathers and daughters interact. So she's looking for Mr. Freeman, her mother's boyfriend, um, to show her the attention and affection that a father would show her. And, um, this is, I, I want to be very clear, I'm not saying that it is her fault in any way. What I'm saying is that those things make for an an easy target for a person who's a pedophile looking to, um, looking to offend. She doesn't know what's happening to her. She really is just craving the approval of an adult male. She longs to be held and hugged and given any type of affection. So she doesn't fully understand and um, he takes advantage of this and then assaults her. So this combined with her mother's neglect really does make her more vulnerable for an attack. Um, this is her father. Later on, she lives with her father for a short period of time. And what I would like you to notice here is the way in which there is a distinct role reversal. Maya's mother really, in some, by the time they're reunited, especially in San Francisco, um, Maya's mother really does try to parent her. And that is a trust that needs to be built up. But her father does not try to parent her at all. And in, in many ways, she is really more like his parent than the other way around. Um, she drives him. She cleans up after his messes. She deals with his addiction and his um, dysfunctional relationships interacting with his girlfriends almost like they're her siblings um, or his girlfriend almost like she's her sibling rather than um, rather than you know an adult in her life so just as Maya's relationship with her mother is healed later on in the story she does find a father figure not with her actual father um, but with daddy Clydell daddy Clydell is Vivian's second husband and he is described as a simple, confident man. So what I want you to look for, um, and I don't have this word in here, but I should, so I will add it. Um, this idea in literature that we have um, of a foil. A foil character is someone who is um, depicted in a an almost contrasting or opposite way um, to another character to kind of show the difference between the two. So her father um, is kind of a flashy ne'er-do-well who is going um, out drinking all the time and going down to Mexico without telling his girlfriend. Gladi Daddy Clydell is um, more confident and um, a different type of personality. So I'd like to look for you to look for the similarities between the two men and also the differences. 
Um, the ways that Maya searches for a father figure, how Uncle Willie and Daddy Clydell fulfill this role, how does Mr. Freeman prey on her need for a father, and how does Bailey, you know, so much of this is focused on Maya and certainly in it, it's women's literature class, so we're focusing on her more, um, and she's the author, but really also how does this affect her brother? How is he attempting to act like a man without a solid father figure to emulate, particularly later on when it comes to issues of sex, which again, we're going to explore a little bit more in our next lecture. Um, but he really doesn't have a strong male role model and because of that um, struggles quite a bit. Friendship. Um, this I believe is a picture of Maya's brother Bailey um, but again I haven't gotten exact confirmation on that um, but there it is. <laughs> Sorry. The lack of love in Maya's life from her parental figures really permeates through all aspects of her life. She and Bailey are almost inseparable. Even after going mute, she still talks to him and they really are best friends um, completely. They're together quite a bit. They're um, close in age, so it's not unusual, right, for siblings to be who are close in age and who have experienced the same trauma to kind of cling to each other. But other than Bailey, she really has no friends. Because of this, she's a sad, lonely little girl um, who seems quite older than her years, particularly after the assault. Mrs. Flowers becomes an older friend for her, kind of a mentor at the request of Maya's grandmother. And, oops. and after she is assaulted and then goes mute, she refuses to talk for a period of time. Mrs. Flowers is really described as an aristocratic woman who helps Maya find her voice, helps her to heal. Um, so it's an older type of friend. Again, possibly another mother figure, um, someone who is encouraging her. Then, this is just a picture of two girls spinning. Um, Maya's first real friend does not appear till chapter 20. So this is a, a book that is 36 chapters long, and it is the story of a girl growing up, and she does not find a friend until more than halfway through the novel or the, the memoir, more than halfway through. This is just particularly important to note. So um, the description of her initial contact with Louise, um, how they become friends and what they do together, um, I'd like you to make sure you watch for the, They're holding hands, they're spinning around, um, looking at the sky and giggling. And they, they're talking in pig Latin and then later in a tut, what's called a tut language. It's like a little language made up by kids. And Maya says she feels like a happy, giggling girl. So how does this friendship really impact her um, as a person and allow her to be a child um, when she often doesn't feel like one? So um, things to look for. How does she grow as a person because of her solitude, this lack of friendship? She talks about Shakespeare and how he's her first great white love and she feels bad once she realizes he's white because she loves Shakespeare so much. She reads many other things. Um, her education is particularly important to her. Her family is important to her. So how does she, um, how is she close to her brother? Then later on, as they grow older, that friendship changes and she begins to feel separated from him. So I would like you to look for those characterization changes um, and those kind of, I guess, twists in the plot as their relationship develops. The normalcy of chapters 20 to 22. Um, so as Maya meets Louise, as they have this friendship, as there's kind of a first crush, um, Valentine's given to her by a boy. It's so normal, right? It's a it's a normal kid thing to have, to have a crush in. Uh, I don't know what grade it is, but let's say she's in sixth grade by that point, maybe seventh. Um, to have somebody who you like and have them send you a secret Valentine 
and to giggle about that with your girlfriends. So much more normal than is what is going on in the rest of her life. So having this friend and ha being at school is really a refuge in that way. And also the need for a mentor in her life. So an older friend who's not a parent um, who can also um, help her feel like a girl who doesn't have to have all the answers. Identity and coming of age. So I talked before about the structure of this book and how um, it is really shaped by memory. Some critics say that there is kind of a loose plot structure here as the story is a coming of age story. Um, the, the term for this, I don't know if I have it in here, but I, I certainly think have it in your reading guide, is Bildungsdung Roman, um, meaning that it is the story of a growing up, coming of age, having an intellectual or spiritual or actual physical growth. Um, Daniela Dobos explains, it is an, oh, there it is. <laughs> it is an African-American Bildungsroman made of a prologue plus 36 episodic chapters, which gradually build up to Marguerite's assertion of identity, learning words, and rejecting racism. Um, we're going to talk more about racism and resilience and resistance next time. But certainly, I think that you could see kind of a wider, um, if not exactly a plot arc, at, at least a theme of identity and coming of age. Um, the typical coming of age story pattern has um, the character is youthful and immature. The character in encounters a problem. There's a struggle to overcome. They make a big decision. And then at the end, the character has changed. We don't have these exact plot points. There's no major one major decision. There's no one major struggle. There are many, many struggles al along the way. And certainly, if the, even in the prologue, um, even in the prologue, she's not naive and innocent. Even in chapter one, she she and her brother have been abandoned. Um, so in that sense, it's not exactly a typical coming of age pattern. But I think that it is important to kind of keep that in mind. Um, Maya begins the story in a world of shadows and moves toward the light, toward um, hope. She is known as a sensitive child. The sensitivity is heightened when she experiences trauma. Over the next few years, she struggles with feeling of guilt, remorse, confusion, unworthiness. She sees many incidents of racism, the ways in which African Americans are oppressed, um, from the incident of the KKK hunting a man in her town um, to the white dentist who refuses to treat her. There she is later on. I love that picture. And instead of remaining a victim or, or being a victim, Maya digs in. She's at the top of her class at school. Um, when she attends an integrated school, she kind of realizes those opportunities that she's been missing, um, determined to learn as much as she can. By the time she works for a white woman who attempts to rename her Mary, she begins to resist. And eventually she finds her voice. She reconnects with her body through dance. She begins to see herself as beautiful and graceful. And at the end of the book, she's an unwed teenage mother, but there is hope for her future. So this is not depicted as something that carries a stigma. And I, I mentioned this before, but this is important to note that the book ending of beginning being a child without a mother and the end being a young woman who is a mother. In that sense, you do see the arc of coming of age, but education plays a large role. And so do um, the various people in her life as she sees the ways in which um, they are forming their identities and she is kind of struggling to form one of her own. So she knows that there will be a struggle at the end of the book, but she seems ready to face and survive it. <laughs> that came out weird. Um, <laughs> there we go. Um, th so the loose structure of a coming of age narrative, something to look for. The ways in which she is guided 
in some cases and other cases really left to her own devices. Again, kind of connecting to the idea of friendship, mentorship, and parents that we've been talking about. How does she move throughout life with or without help? Um, Changes in tone and the mood of the story as she comes of age and how race and gender play a role in her struggles and her triumphs. Um, This is a two examples, two short excerpts, how she sees herself. A too big Negro girl with nappy black hair, broad feet, and a space between her teeth that would hold a number two pencil. These are the really like ugly words that she's using to describe herself. Um, you know, des- describing herself as uh, she uses the word ugly. That is not me saying that. That is her saying that. Um, broad feet. I have a big space between my pe- teeth that would hold the number two pencil. Um, that I was too big. That I was too. Uh, later on, I think she says that she was too heavy. But she just does not feel at all attractive especially when she's young because of the things that she has experienced and then later here's what she says to be left alone on the tightrope of youthful unknowing is to experience the excruciating beauty of full freedom and the threat of eternal indecision few if any survive their teens most surrender to the vague but murderous pressure of adult conformity becomes easier to die and avoid conflict than to maintain a constant battle with the superior forces of maturity now what is she saying there she's saying that in some ways being left alone on this tightrope of youthful unknowing on um which is a great metaphor um she had a lot of freedom so the the lack of friendship the lack of guidance in many ways allowed her to avoid peer pressure and to become um an adult without conforming to society standards of what an adult should be or what that should look like um and the constant battle Um, to mature and but doing that in a way that you have decided I love this quote this is um I love to see a young girl go out and grab the world by the lapels life's a bitch you gotta go out and kick ass (laughs) Maya Angelou (laughs) ladies and gentlemen and and that is um that is this book you know having her move from Um, just feeling horrible about herself and being very sensitive and young child to trying to go out and grab the world by the lapels and the the hope that she will do that and knowing that she did right because you know that it's a true story and that more are coming so next time we're going to talk about five more prominent themes and um, this is where I There we go. Um, We'll pick up here and we'll look at a few more themes in the book. And I look forward to hearing your thoughts. Thanks, everybody.